to another episode of In the Game. I'm your host, Terry Johnson, and In the Game is an engaging conversation with our guests when we talk about sports. Plain and simple, we talk it from an athlete's perspective, the competition, the fan, and even on the business side. We talk about key moments in the game that's culture and entertainment. What I'm excited about today is today's guest, um, Mr. Travis Stride. And our topic today is the rise, the fall, and rise again of an elite athlete. And Travis is our special guest who we're going to share the stories with. So let's get started and let's get into in the game. Travis, welcome. How are you doing today? Hey, do, doing well. That, that, that title. Uh, kind of got me the rise and fall and rise again. That's kind of rough. <laughs> well, I, 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 I never wanted to be that guy. Well, you know, it's all good, though. I mean, yeah. and, and I think it's important as we talk today and for our listeners to understand the journey. Yeah. The one thing that I love the most is your journey and who you are today, what you've accomplished, those moments. And I really want us to kind of impact it because it's for that aspiring athlete, that athlete who's in the moment. Yeah that athlete who's transitioned. And then we're also gonna talk about a father who's doing it again with another athlete. With another athlete. So, oh, I yeah. mean, I, I, you know, I use that title, but I think it's important in today's time to understand that, you know, this journey, there's, there's gonna be a rise and a fall, but will you rise again? Yeah. And you are in a testament to that. So, for our listeners, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm gonna allow you to introduce yourself. Tell us, give us your background, where you're from. Yeah, so Travis Stroud, born in, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I uh, grew up in Decatur, um, off Gresham Road. Okay. So I am a uh, an Atlanta native, uh, East Side, right? The Deck, Decatur, <laughs> right? All of those uh, those descriptions that you hear uh, in the uh, in the industry. Um, grew up at Gresham Park. Uh, was on the MDM program. Went to Dunwoody High School. Uh, the MDM program was a minority to majority uh, program that offered us opportunity. Uh, you, you think why? should we have to go up north to get a quality right. you know, education or opportunity, that lets you know that there is a systemic scenario oh, that wow. we're dealing with now, finally, yes. right? Yeah, we still do. Um, from there, man, uh, had some successes in the classroom as a student athlete, uh, won two wrestling championships, was a baseball champion, and a state football champion as well. Uh, and then uh, had an opportunity to go to any college, D1 college in the nation my senior year. Uh, decided to stay home at the University of Georgia and play baseball or football there um, so my parents and my family could, you know, be a part of mm -hmm. uh, the experience just because they've always been there, right? Mm -hmm. um, from there, um, you know, had some successes early, and then I had some some, some, some shortfalls, okay. you know, early. I had some injuries that I had to endure. Uh, so the perspective changed. It was, you know, things started to, you know, manifest and matriculate the way I thought they should, but then I started hitting walls. Injuries started to happen. So mm -hmm. I had to change my paradigm and my perspective. I uh, always engaged and thought being a student athlete was important, but um, had to really focus on that, right? And I preach now to young folk, mm -hmm. not having a fallback plan, but having a parallel initiative. Oh, wow. Right, being able to prepare at the same time, because if you look at the life of a professional athlete, it's not, you know, a lot of Champ Bailey's or you know, uh, Tom Brady's in the world, or even Deion Sanders. Right. You know, that's, you know, far and few between that get that type of, you know, longevity in the sport. Mm -hmm. So you retire young, so you should be able to transition into your um, your life after, you know, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I, I've always had aspirations. I wanted my league money, the successes that I uh, – enjoyed mm -hmm. from being an athlete i wanted that to fuel my entrepreneur spirit okay but when i fell short because of the injuries i still had the aspirations but i didn't have the means ah okay so that transition was hard right however yeah. the only thing i had to focus on it, it it almost took me out though terry it did man if i didn't have good people around me mm -hmm. you know from fraternity brothers blood brothers mom dad you know family to keep me um, to keep me grounded, it, it would have been uh, it would have it would have been a real detriment. Okay, a real detriment, and I'll tell you why, uh, you know, later. Well, 
And, and then I have two a couple businesses that I I engage in as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna get to that, I'm, and yeah. I'm glad you shared that because I want our listeners to understand the depth, yeah, and the complexity, yeah, you are as a person, yeah, but how rich it is, and I how, appreciate and, that. and how it's defined you to who you are today. Yeah. So let's let's go back. You mentioned you're from Atlanta, true ATL alien, ATL alien, Decatur, yep, the Gresham well, yeah. Park. Tell us about your youth experience. What was your first youth organized youth sport you played at yeah. Gresham Park? And tell us your fondest memory there when you reflect back. So, you- so growing up, man, I, you know, I wasn't the best athlete. Okay. Right? Um, but, you know, Gresham Park got a way of nurturing and bringing the best <laughs> out you. Right. You know, what don't make you going to break you. <laughs> that is so true. That is you so know, true. Some of the greatest people, athletes, coaches, dads that I've ever been around came from that part. Yes. I started playing organized baseball. Wasn't always a good athlete, but was always a heck of a baseball player, and I grew into it. Mm-hmm. I was always the biggest dude in the class. Okay. You know. So, you know, my fondest memory is just being able to be with family every Friday, every Saturday, mm-hmm. from sun up, well, during the summer times, on Fridays in the evening to late at night. Saturdays from sun up to sundown, mm-hmm. watching and playing baseball, right. being in the culture and environment, everybody's families eating, everybody raising everybody's kids. Right. It wasn't this my kid, that's your kid. It was a community. Right. It was it was a true village at Gresham. And you could see the, the, the harvest that came from that environment. And, you know, my fondest memory was being in that environment, being able to learn from the older people, to being able to, to get my opportunity to play. And just the skills that I developed, you know, as a person uh, at Gresham Park. It's not one fun memory. It's just there is nothing like the park. Right. That's what we call it, the park. The park. We're going down to the park. Right. We didn't even enunciate it right. right. <laughs> We're going to the park. Right. Right. You know. But, but, how, it, but that's changed today. You talked it's about, horrible. you know, that Friday going and being all day Saturday and just that environment. Now I know that you have a son yeah. that plays um, baseball, travel ball, and he's very good. So he's in a competitive team. Yeah, it, it's, it's it's I think travel baseball and AAU has killed the true essence of youth sports mm. because now it's rushed. Uh, kids aren't able to develop at Gresham Park. That culture of being there all time, all the time, you were able to ve- to develop into who you pretty much turned out to be, and right. then all of us spread from Gresham Park. And went to the lakesides, the Redans, the Stone Mountains, the right. Dunwoodies, right. the McNairs, the Southwest of Cavs, right. and did really, really well mm-hmm. because of that, uh, those skills that we attained down at that one uh, institution. But now you got teams that want ready-made players, right? They want to manage players. They don't want to develop players. Right. And I remember coaches down at Gresham Park had kids that put the glove on the wrong hand, <laughs> but then end up turning out to be beasts, right. you know, later on. So that the essence of travel ball and – I want this kid because he developed hand-eye coordination early. People fail to realize most kids develop hand-eye coordination early because they're not going to be that big. <laughs> right. So if the daddy 5'7 and the mama 5'2, the kid will develop a sense of uh, 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 athleticism a little bit earlier than the kid that may be 6'4, 6'5, right. Right. right? Because of the, the coordination isn't there. So I think um, today's sports is over-specialized, man. Because you see a lot of um, non-contact injuries. Mm-hmm. It's because kids work the same muscles time and time again, year in and year out. It's not like playing football, baseball, basketball. We consider that active rest because you're still active, you're still competing at a high level, but you're using different muscle groups. Right. But if you're constantly using the same muscle groups over and over and over again, it'll wear out. True. It'll wear out. So I think we got to get back to – uh, allowing our kids because everybody feel like kids can only play one sport. And the reason why Pat Mahomes is so dynamic is because he played more than one sport. He's just doing what we grew up doing. Right. So now he's a, he's an anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. Good point. <laughs> That's a good point. Let's talk about your relationship with your father as, a, as that young kid growing up. Yeah. So you like you said, hey, I wasn't the best. I grew into it. I had coaches around me that nurtured me and, and yeah. family. Talk about that relationship with your father. So my dad, man, rest his soul, man. I lost my dad, and my dad raised some real men. Mm. You know, I, they had posts on uh, on Facebook and social media that he was one of the most underrated coaches uh, to come through Gresham. Okay, right. 
And me and my older brothers, we were pretty good. Right. And he was an alpha male in the house with, you know, three gorillas <laughs> in a 1,300 square foot home. Right. <laughs> three bedroom, one and a half bath. So he had to kind of, and he was about 155 pounds, about six one. <laughs> yeah. So, so real slim shady. Uh huh. But no, Pops was always there, man. My dad coached me from, well, he started coaching my brother um, when he was five. And then I was two years old. And then when I became five, he dropped down to coach me up until I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And going back to say how coaches develop kids, we only had six core kids that we would take from age group to age, age group. Right. And we would, you know, pick up kids depending on the, the age group. But he spent time nurturing and developing us. And most of us from five years old ended up playing college baseball wow. or football. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, on the next level. So my dad, man, taught me consistency, hard work, um, you know, accountability, man. Right. And uh, uh, he, he's just, he, now let me tell you something. He wasn't the one uh, to pat you on the back now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he probably drove me to make some of these bad decisions I made because we was trying to prove um, to Pops that, you know, we, we can really, and he didn't really put pressure on us. Mm -hmm. He supported what we did. Gotcha. But if we went three for four, Double single, you know, he like, okay, what happened on that, that fourth one? <laughs> <laughs> if I had three sacks, right, you know, two tackles for a loss, he like, well, you missed the tackle, big guy. <laughs> oh, wow. So he kept us grounded. However, my mother didn't tell us until later that he would brag on us to her. Okay. And I think that's the true benefit of having two parents, mm. right? Because my mother was a nurturer and my dad was that dog. Gotcha. Right? But it's crazy because when I was being recruited, that was looked upon as me being weak mm. because I came from a two parent home. Right. A lot of people don't know that because I didn't come from the, the cliche as one parent, right. poverty scenario. Right. My dad served in the military, he's a weapons expert. Didn't learn that until I wrote his obituary. So I didn't realize I was walking around a killer <laughs> the whole time until <laughs> hey, until I did his obituary right. and got his DD-214. Right. And I was like, man, this dude could have knocked our heads <laughs> off. And we had no idea. Right. But we understood based on the preparation and, um, you know, the consistency of getting up in the morning. Routine. Right. It's routine. important. I'm trying to get my son right now and my daughter in a routine. It's kind of hard being an entrepreneur because I don't really have a routine. Right. They're like, well, you don't You don't do work. that. You <laughs> Come home, you in the same shirt. Yeah. Right? When I left, you talking about do this? What you do yeah. all day, right? Yeah, but me and Pops, man, uh, that was my guy. We bumped heads a lot. Let okay. me tell you why. Because he comes from a uh, a conservative background. Okay. You know, my dad never really put the cart before the horse. When we uh, was starting to get recruited, he was like, "Cool," right? When I started really getting highly recruited, right? He was like, "Cool." Um, then when I went to you know, decided to go to my college and did started doing well, he was like, cool. It wasn't like we going to the league. Like a, a lot of parents put that on their kids. Right. My dad was, he kept everything close to the right. chest, mm -hmm. right? And he was like, the worst thing that can happen in this situation, you get this free education. Of course it wasn't free. It, it came with a cost. Yeah, it ain't never free. Ain't never free. We're going to talk but about that. But if something else happens, that's a plus. Right. Right. So that's, that. He continued to instill humility mm. uh, and hard work into us, so we never got complacent. It was one thing to be content, but never complacent. complacent. You know what I'm saying? So that was one of, one of the, the the biggest uh, and fondest memories I had. You know, growing up at Gresham Park, family, having something to do, looking forward to every weekend, and then having your pops right. be there with you. Um, you know, time and time again. Well, I want to say something to my listeners. I think that's important. It doesn't matter the dynamics of the relationship that the mother or father has with each other yeah. regarding the child. It's important to be there for them. Now, you and I will definitely agree the benefit of having both parents in the home speaks volumes. Oh, it's volume. But we need to also have active fathers who say, I may not be in the home, but I'm going to be there checking on you in your homework. I'm going to be there at your game supporting you to let you know that I'm still accountable, so are you. Yeah. I'm still here to, 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 to say that I believe in you to go to the next level. And I think we miss that a lot of times, because you're right. You know, Everyone wants to talk about the story of, uh, it comes from a single household parent. The, the, the father's not active, and he's, he doesn't have influence. 
But that's totally different because I think no matter what the scenario is, we've got to be involved. Yeah. We've got to be involved. Now, you said something interesting you kind of blew over, and I want our listeners to know. You come with a, uh, other brothers. You, your father did not just groom one yeah. elite scholar athlete. That was several. Yeah, it was several. It was, it, it, was, it was two of us. My older brother, he decided not to you know, play. He wanted to go to trade school, mm-hmm. but was a heck of an athlete. Mm-hmm. But he got burned out. My middle brother ended up uh, revamping the Georgia State baseball program. Turn it from put it on his back, right, and build it to where it is now. To everybody's listening, from Coach Hurst to whole nine, he need to be in the Hall of Fame, right? Because he put it on his back to get that program to where it is now. Single handedly beat Georgia Tech by himself with a grand slam <laughs> when Georgia State didn't have nothing. right, <laughs> right, and they was number one team in the nation, nation at, at that, that time. time. I remember that. You yes. follow what I'm saying? So, of course, my brother's going into uh, Dunwoody Hall of Fame uh, this year. I went in in 2011. Right. We'll be the two, the first brothers to go. Uh, into the hall uh, wow. together, so he's finally starting to get some homage. But he was—we're totally different, man. And a lot of my successes came from my brother, man, because it drove me. It's kind of like Tamar. Mm-hmm. He got three older brothers to look up to, right? So he got all of the seeds. He saw what son was good at, what made daddy put them hands on me. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't do. So I learned. I learned all of that. See, I'm Tamar right. at the end of the day. Um, and it, it always trickled down to us because we have examples to pull from. Right. The good and bad examples to pull from. And um, he set the tone, man, because stuff came easy to him that didn't come easy for me, right. athletically. Right. Yeah. So. So we've transitioned from Gresham Park and now we're at Dunwoody High School. And you talked about the MDM program. I was a product of it too, also. I went to Lithonia. Just imagine if we all just stayed home and we had poured into. The walk we would have went 0 and 7. We would have went 0 and 10 because <laughs> everybody couldn't have played. Just think, just, just. But, but all that talent, though. I know it, but the coaches that we had probably would have screwed up because they didn't know who to play. <laughs> That's a. T- we would have been five and six deep <laughs> right. in baseball and football, right? Because when they put out the DeKalb County uh, All Decade Team, T.J. Johnson got. The running back position over Rod Perriman. And, and Rod could, Perriman broke all the records. I couldn't believe it. You, all of us came from Gresham Park. Park right, right. You know, so it's Quincy Call. All of us Quincy. came from Gresham Park, man. And we had to spread the love. Just think, man, there wasn't a lot of us at Dunwoody. No? We had a heck, heck of a coach. And he had a, you know, a heck of a, a, a coaching scenario. And then we just added to what they had in place with the discipline. And the opportunity now. Right, right. Now, we did have the resources. Right, now, now, yeah. You know, the Booster Club could have had <laughs> over 500000 back then. That's a lot of money. Yeah. In the budget. Yeah. Right? So, um, but yeah, that, that experience was something, man, because it that was one of the things that could either make or break a young person. But it was good that I came from an all-black uh, scenario because I had uh, – major aware- awareness of, of self. I mm-hmm. knew exactly who I was. Right. I knew I belonged wherever I, I went because of the competition. We had the academics, you know, at home, but going to Dunwoody was crazy. And then speaking about my brother, he was a trailblazer because a lot of people, I think the furthest north was Henderson and Lakeside. Right. Right. And then Dunwoody was way a little bit further, at least 20 minutes further, you know, up north. And to have to get on the bus, five o'clock in the morning, so we never saw the sun rise or fall for five years. For five years. For six months of our lives, because sometimes we're able to, you know, leave early and late and the whole nine once right. the season's over. But we played sports year round, so we never got a chance to see it. So we up before the sun comes up, and we back when the sun go down, right? So that was a a sense of uh, of discipline, and then us having to get up early, go to class, uh, go to weight training or whatever, go to practice. Then we have to ride another hour back home. We have to figure out how to spend time with the fam, eat our meals, Mm -hmm. then compete academically when other kids have already been able to. And then it was never a sense of uh, empathy. Mm. You know, they felt we had it easy. But people don't look at the grind, man. You know, you know, uh, trust the process. Don't rush the process. Uh, and then, the, the craziest thing was, 
uh, the ridicule that we got for leaving Gresham or South Side. Oh, the South Side. To of go Canada. north. Right. So we, they didn't want us up north. And I can say that because it was true, because I've had conversations with friends of mine. They didn't understand why or who. Mm-hmm. That lets you know there's systemic scenarios in place for them to even have to implement the program in the first place. Right, right. That nobody wants to talk about, right? <laughs> and then when you come back to the crib, it's like sell out. Right. So where you fit in? It's like being in a, a mixed relate. I mean, uh, being a mixed kid, you know, uh, not knowing which side, you know, to take ownership in. So you out here pretty much by yourself and with the brothers and the sisters that's going through the similar situation as you. Um, but yeah, I met some great, you know, developed great opportunities, man. Um, you know, it, it took uh, a lot of courage and, uh, you know, just a lot, a lot of prayer as well for us to, uh, but the seeds that my parents sowed in us allowed us to engage and be, you know, prepared, you know, for the environment. And I wouldn't trade it right. for anything in my life because of the relationships that I, uh, that I built. And I think it's important for our listeners to understand where we are in this conversation. One thing he talked about is understanding the process. There's a grind. So as an athlete, are you committed to go through the grind of that process to get to what you need to achieve that ultimate goal? One being having humility through that process. Cause you're going to have some success and failure, but you got to be calm. You got to be, you got to, you got to be humble. Yep. Something you said, dad was always cool. Cool. Dad never. He never, never. But he was cool. And then knowing that if I want to be the best or to get better, I got to work at it. And I got to emphasize that in the classroom because I wonder that's where I'm going with it. But also just dealing with life scenarios. I agree with you. You know, you're going into an environment where you're not wanted because of the color of your skin. They don't think you can accomplish the goals or the things they have out for you or that you should, you know. So you're fighting that and then you come back home and you got those that your brothers and sisters who look like you from the community going, well, I don't why, you tr- leave? why you leave? Yeah. So, so you had done with it. You're successful in the classroom. You're successful on the athletic field. At that point, you're doing baseball, football, and wrestling in high school. Yep. And, and you, I, you know, for, for, you know, periods of time, uh, was the only black baseball player. Even though my older brother was, you know, it was a similar situation. He and uh, one of his teammates. So we've always – now, football, of course, you had a little bit more uh, diversity. Mm-hmm. Baseball wasn't as diverse. Wrestling wasn't as diverse. Right. And that's still like that today. It's still like that. And that's one of the best sports in the game to be a character. Because mm. you can't blame that butt whipping on nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so you look around like, what? <laughs> it's just, and you got a crowd looking at you. Right. And, well, you're trying to fix your head gear, <laughs> and you can't blame nobody but yourself. True character builder, and a lot of our kids need that. Wow. <laughs> but um, but yeah. So so yeah, I, I I did have some successes, man. But however, I had to find my way mm-hmm. in my comfort mm-hmm. zone, and what drove me once I identified that we had the ability to transcend our current environment. And we didn't come from a bad, we did I mean, we didn't come from a bad no. environment. No. We had a house, right? a yard. Two parents working who provided. But we still wanted to be that first generation to go to school and graduate. Mm-hmm. Pledge a fraternity. Right. That was huge. That was one of my milestones, was to be a Q. Wow. And regardless on what happened, I wanted to make sure that happened because I'm big on legacy. Mm-hmm. And once we identified a way, because mom and dad, my dad worked 34 years at um at AT and T. That wasn't enough to send, you know, two boys to college. My mm. my older brother was more in the trades. Right. He'll build you a house. Right. You know, detail. He's more outdoors. I mean, he was he been you know building stone walls since he was 14, 15 years old. Wow. But that made him a good athlete because he he throwing rocks and stones. <laughs> <laughs> so so putting somebody in front of him that right. wasn't that. Right. But the thing is. He's been more of that tech, you know, which is good because everybody is not meant for everybody to go right. to college right. or that may not be the best thing for you. You got to have options. You talked, you said it earlier, you got, you parallel, you know, we've got certain goals and aspirations, but let's parallel. Let's parallel it. So let's, we don't fall back because in athletics and sports, we've always been taught to move forward, to push forward, 
to get that extra yard. Uh, so why would you teach falling back? Right. On right. the flip side. Right. right. Let's continue to parallel and move forward. Right. And transition at the same time. How did you manage that success at Dunwoody? You, you guys won a state championship. You done a baseball team. You made it to the state. Did you win it the state? We we lost, man. It okay. Was four, let me tell you something. That that that's the game that hunt me. Um, Chris Benson, he ended up going number one overall, mm. right? And that the, that following year's draft. Gotcha. Played at Sprayberry. Seth LaFerro, who's the head coach at Pace, Pace, Pace uh, Academy. Yeah. Right. We had them. This is the North Georgia Championship. This is you put us in the state championship against Evans mm -hmm. of Augusta. Right. So uh, it was a tied series, and um, it's two outs. No, yeah, it's two outs. We're up 5-3 in the bottom of the seventh inning, and they end up beating us 6-5. Oh, wow. And our third baseman was one of the coldest – third baseman in the game mm. mr slow dribbler okay they had guys in scoring position um and then uh well they scored one and i think it was uh five four and then they had a uh they had somebody on second and third he missed a slow dribbler and they sent everybody and they beat <laughs> us six five. Oh wow two outs man five three uh so that kept us from going to the state championship my brother them uh, and his team my brother them my brother and his team in 90, they, um, they played um, Augusta of Columbus, of Columbus in okay. the state championship. Okay. And then they end up losing in wow. a close series. Wow. So we've been there. Right. Uh, baseball has always been a huge staple uh, up in that uh, Dunwoody area and up in the culture. A lot of East Cobb guys that played up there. So when you made the decision to go to Georgia, how did you negotiate being able to play two sports? And we, we've heard it, other athletes. I mean, I, and I, I want my listeners to understand, not every college athlete is given an opportunity to play two sports. you got to be a hell of an athlete. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a compliment. You had to be a bad boy. I but appreciate how, it. How did you negotiate that? So, so because I was, I, was, uh, I was blessed, man. I was exceptional because I never dreamed of being a top athlete I, my dream was to always be the best at what i set out to accomplish like if i saw Deion sanders or bo jackson or if i even saw a movie mm -hmm. with commando or rambo in it i wanted to be them <laughs> so i've always set the paradigm mm -hmm. to be that okay. the perspective um you know was to 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 do that and the successes that i had you know in high school i was 255 pounds I was 6'3". Mm -hmm. I could run. I ran a 4.75. Wow. I hit from the left side, throw right-handed. Mm -hmm. Right? So I wasn't really a power hitter, but I still averaged about eight home runs mm -hmm. to 10. Uh, uh, but I was a, a double guy. Okay. A stand-up double guy. Stand-up double guy. Gotcha. <laughs> Triples every now and then. <laughs> but I was a gap hitter. Okay. Because I, you know, that, that, that was the thing. So, um, and that was always my first love. I couldn't play um, – football because when i was eight years old i was 140 pounds okay so that meant i would have been playing with the big boys. big boys <laughs> yeah because it so, wasn't aged then it was all about it was, yeah, you, you could play older but lighter and right, all that yeah right. the metro yes but then i you know i'd have been playing against high school guys at eight years old right really so um so my focus was baseball and then i didn't start playing football until i was in the eighth and ninth grade mm. and still had an opportunity to have the career that I had, mm -hmm. not having all those miles, and I, my body still broke down, you know, after I started the, the game late. But so the process was simple. My preparation in the classroom and my performance on the field gave, gave me marketing uh, or revenue or power uh, when I went to the table. I now, it. I couldn't have one without the other. I had the academia. Right. I had the performance, and I showed that I was mature enough mm -hmm. to do both. I have a letter I can I can uh, I can show you guys from Georgia Tech and the University of uh, Georgia. They gave me the two, Florida State, talk Notre Dame. Those were the four schools mm -hmm. that we talked about me playing both sports. Um, so everybody was on board. I got down to Georgia Tech in Georgia. Coach Hall still at Georgia Tech right now. Uh, Bill Lewis was the head coach, wrote me a letter that, uh, you know, once I 
uh, finished my first year, uh, I could, I would be obligated to football. I could spend all of my time playing baseball. Coach Goff, his only stipulation was I play my freshman year, go through first year spring practice. That would have just, I would have had to weather the storm of going to baseball practice and spring practice during that time. Right. But after that, I would be uh, able to play both. Hmm. But, you know, it, it was crazy because my, I don't know, I think God just didn't have it for me uh, to go to the next level because whenever I tried to be that elite athlete, and it is always there, and I think that's the respect that I have from guys who played 14, 15 years. The way I'm, I'm still in the circle is because they know the kind of athlete I was mm-hmm. and how I've had to transition because after football season, at the end of every season, I would have a major injury to rehab from. Wow. And you know, baseball and college start January, February. Right. So that's doing my rehab. So mm-hmm. I'm rehabbing and still, so I could only DH. Mm-hmm. And then we had a coaching change with Coach Dunning. Mm-hmm. Um, he wasn't as friendly to it because he wanted me to focus on football. Right. Right. But I still had the grounds because Coach Dooley signed off, you know, on the, uh, the whole marriage and right. the c- scenario. But I didn't want to cause that flack. Um, you know, I wanted to focus on being the best, you know, keep the co- scholarship going. Right. But it, it turned out to be a, uh, an issue, you know, because it was a coaching change. Wow. And those are some of the things that I try to, you know, help young folk understand. Look at the culture and the lay of the land, the landscape of the team. If a coach is in the hot seat, he's recruiting you hard. There is no guarantee that he'll be there, mm-hmm. you know, when it's time for you to, you know, perform. Right. And then you have to build another rapport with a coach um, that may not have your best interest. Right. Or it's- that may have felt, felt slight, slighted when I was coming out because maybe he tried to, you know, recruit me and I didn't even acknowledge him. Right. And now he's So they it. hold, they hold oh, that, grudges. Right. They do. They do. You know. Uh, I was looking at Rudy yesterday. Okay. And, you know, <laughs> the one coach promised him that he was going to play and dress out. Right. Dan Devine gets the job. Right. And it was like, no. Regardless on how he's worked hard for the team and prepared right. the team, right. if it weren't for the team stepping up for Rudy, Rudy wouldn't have got a chance to be Rudy. Right. We, we would have had a movie. Right. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you know. so, so it's an opportunity, man. So um, being able to negotiate, um, I had leverage. Okay. Because of, uh, you know, I had the um, uh, the academics in place, and then I was able to perform, and I showed the maturity. Um, so those were the chips that I needed to go in and and be able to make it happen. And then I was good. I mean, I, it wasn't like I was I was reaching. Right. I could legitimately have not played football and be, been a a major league baseball player. Wow. And people that know me know I have that had that ability to do that, um, and vice versa. Mm. And my body didn't start breaking down until I started playing football. <laughs> well, so now we're at Georgia, and I'm glad you. that's a great transition to the question. You're at Georgia, you're doing both, you're playing football. Take us back to the first time you walked out on Sanford Stadium game day, 90,000. Because this is that time where, you, as an athlete, I've arrived. I mean, yeah, you go through the cruise, but I'm talking about that first oh, time me, when you me, walked out. Let me 70. tell you something. It was one of the <laughs> – it was one of the best and worst experiences <laughs> I ever had. You know why? It's because we played against the University of Tennessee. Mm. And that whole offensive line was on the front of Sports Illustrated. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, it was, it was exciting until they said, Stroud, <laughs> get in. And I'm like, why? <laughs> Man, they put hands on me the entire time game oh wow they turned me into a man that was my first game okay Peyton hadn't started yet um I think uh uh I think Todd Helton was a quarterback okay Todd was still you know Todd yeah. ended up going baseball right had a heck of a career uh major league baseball but um but that game and Stan- that was our first game in Sanford Stadium because we had two away games South okay. Carolina right I traveled didn't play right. you know I didn't play into the third game <laughs> And uh, I think that was on purpose. They wanted to throw me in the fire, <laughs> and it worked out. So I, I learned the difference between men and boys right. when, I, when I got a chance to, uh, to play in that game. But the environment, man, is it's unexplainable. Uh, the adrenaline, uh, the rush. When you make a play, man, and 100,000 people call your name, 
you know, that that that, that can do something to the cycle. <laughs> right. Yeah, that I mean, in the league it's only 60,000, but when a, when you're rocking and you can't hear yourself think, uh-huh. you getting slapped on the helmet, everybody know your name. Mm-hmm. And then you might have a couple uh, you know, young ladies winking at you. Uh-huh. You know. <laughs> So that it does something to you, uh, to your mindset, your paradigms. Uh, it, it tends to shift a little <sighs> bit, you know. And then when you, it's like a a, a drunkenness or a, a high of, of of adrenaline that you want to continuously chase. Right. Right. And that's why I think a lot of us athletes, when that's taken from us, we don't know what to do. Believe it or not, I think a lot of us have low self-esteem because just think now, ever since we were younger, we had people validating who we were. Right. That a boy. Good job. Right. Right. And when that stops, what do you do? What do you pull from? How do you create that dopamine or that serotonin it's in the brain? brain? Right. Right. It's, it's huge because now you fall into a state of depression. That's why I was saying it was rough because when it stopped, not on my terms, it stopped and I had to figure out like what's next. It was literally me accomplishing doing really, really well, everything falling in line, and then I hit a, a wall, mm-hmm. boom, out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Couldn't talk to my mama, couldn't talk to my dad, Cause my they brother. Had, they hadn't experienced I couldn't that. talk to the pastor. Right. That was between me and God right, right then, right? Because the what's next, and I had to really pick myself up, right. brush myself off, and try to figure out what's next. I truly had no idea what was next. A lot of us, have no idea what's next. I mean, just think about a kid going from middle school to high school, or elementary school to middle school, mm-hmm. like high school to college, college to the league, or college to just regular profession. Right. That sense of change, man, is really the only constant of life outside of death. I used to say taxes, but some people don't pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> We're not gonna name it. Yeah, we ain't gonna name no name. <laughs> well, so I, now I learned everybody don't pay taxes. Right, right. <laughs> How they come out to me, but yeah, they don't yeah, got to, yeah. Right. so yeah, so. Uh, so yeah, that sense of change and transition uh, was huge, man. And a lot of us uh, deal with these uh, these demons. And for me, the biggest demon was I was so close to changing my my family. Like now, if people look on the outside looking in, now they'll see, man, you you really doing really really well, right? Right. But for me, it wasn't what I wanted. And then I'm writing a book, and in it. I'm talking about happiness. Like, how do you know you reach happiness? Like, you set a goal, you accomplish that goal, you think, and you 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 revolve everything you do around this one scenario, and you say, man, if I could just reach this, right, I, I'll I'll be good, I'll be happy. Then when you reach it, you only <laughs> content for a little period of time, a small period of time, and then you on to the next. Right. So how do you know you receive that happiness? How you how how you how do you know you achieve that happy place? Right, because I set a goal, I accomplished it. And with the competitive edge that we have, we want more. Right. We want more. And see, we can't associate stuff with our happiness. And that's what I that's why I fell short because I thought I let my fam down because I was so close to changing our generations' lives and I fell short. I want you to repeat that, and that's real important when we talk about that for an athlete or non athlete. Success is not the stuff. It's not the stuff. We got stuff. Deion Sanders said the reason why Shador decided to go to FAU is because they were the best situation to help develop him as a young man. Mm. He said Alabama was going to win, Dad. He said Georgia was going to win regardless, Dad. I need to go down here to FAU so I can help these folks dig themselves out of the situation. Willie Taggart got an unfair shot at Florida State. That is so true. And – I asked him, how you going to develop me? He said, all these folks talking about stuff. He said, I got stuff. Right. I grew up on stuff. He said, let's talk this football. How are you going to help me develop? Are you going to have me under center and pistol, shotgun? How can we do all? Will we have packages and all that? Right. What's the academic track? Mm-hmm. Right? What, what's, the, uh, what, what's that process look like? You know, what's the plan? If I decide to leave after three years, that's why he decided to make that, that transition. Don't go with your favorite, your heart, and – you know, because that's what you always want. You got to go with the best fit for you. Right. You know, and uh, a lot of times, you know, you I think back on some other opportunities. May have been better than others, but I wouldn't change anything. At the, you know, I met my wife. Right. You know, got a, a, a quality uh, education. 
I have some uh, lifelong friends that I, I, I developed as well. I could have gone to Notre Dame or Florida State and had the career I wanted and be dead and gone right now. Right. You know. I mean, I want us to pause. I'm, you said something so important, and I want my, my listeners, whatever they're doing, just to pause and think of what he said. I don't regret my decision because when I reflect back, it was the best for me. Now, that rise that I want to talk about is he went to Georgia. He succeeded. He got an education. He got a wife, and they've created a beautiful family. It put him in a position where he has lifelong friends. Sometimes it's not the stuff. stuff. That's why I went there and wanted you guys to understand. It's not the stuff. It's not the stuff. And you got to realize, even right now, the stuff or the money that people sell their souls for mm. is not even worth nothing. It ain't backed by nothing. Right. True happiness. This pandemic has taught us one thing. The only thing that truly matters are the people between the four walls right. of your home. Mm -hmm. I don't care what kind of aspirations you had in 2020. You couldn't go after them. Right. You couldn't chase them. Right. The only thing that was important is your relationship with God. And I'm speaking about that because that's a big part of the rise. Mm -hmm. We did rise, fall, rise. That's the biggest part of the rise yes. is having faith, faith and being able to focus uh, and ask God. And hold God accountable. Because the, the, the signature on my emails is Proverbs 18, 22. A man's gift makes room for him. Mm -hmm. And my thing is, is identifying what I was good at. How I ended up going to the University of Georgia. When did I decide? you know, that I was a, an athlete and that I could transcend. I had no idea. My whole focus was trying to be the be better than the person next to me. And that manifested into something greater than I even thought of. I limited myself to H HBCUs. Not saying HBCUs are bad, but I just, I never envisioned myself being on that, um, on that level to play on TV. Right. every saturday right you know or in front of a hundred thousand yeah i just i that just wasn't a goal my goal was to go to school i want to be able to go to school for free and play the sport and god made everything else happen wow just like god it's making it happen it now. made this happen right. and he took it away right. and that was my biggest question i'm like god you've got i got all this talent i can't use it i tore both pcls mm. i tore both achilles a complete tear on the right and then the uh, a partial tear on the left uh hyperextending my elbow. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just one of those things of understanding. Um, we have to focus on what's important. And what's important are the things that we can control, man. And, you know, don't, don't focus on the stuff. On the stuff. Because the stuff, it'll be there. Or it won't be there. Right. And we're going to be okay. And we're going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I want to talk about now is the transition from there. You are a business owner. You created several businesses since you've been done but i've been a serial i've been a serial <laughs> entrepreneur okay. and that's horrible right and, no it's not horrible because i was going to teach and say i, I, I want to make sure uh, you <laughs> you say you're from decatur but you sure it's not jamaica you yeah, know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly man i made money nine different ways <laughs> last year wow so and the important thing behind that I, I made money nine different ways last year and seven of those was taken during the pandemic mm. but two of them remained and two remain and that's grace. Mm. That's favor. Right. And that's mercy. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's so true. But most people go at one. Right. And they, they leave everything out. And I, I, I kind of second guess myself on, um, you know, being a jack of all trades and a master of none because I've, I have so many irons in the fire. Right? So going back to Pops, I wanted to, you know, when you playing at a high level, you're getting coached all your life. You kind of tired of taking orders, right? But we all have bosses, even in as an entrepreneur, because we we have to appease those who give us the contracts to do the work. Correct, right? We those we always have people to answer to, to talk to. So don't get it twisted talking about being your own boss, because you'll be your own boss. Well, you know Atlanta is the home of the thirty thousand dollar millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that, right? Right. So everybody a boss in right. Atlanta. Yeah. Um. So you just you you have to kind of um, uh, you know watch it in that regard. Uh, I started Quest Development. I have a degree in Management Information Systems. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to waste a free education, so I focused on something that had some some substance to it. So I, I Terry College of Business graduate, Management Information Systems. Um, uh, it was a degree. So 
while I was playing ball, because I, I was 98, I was picked up as a free agent mm-hmm. um, with the Falcons. And then um, because of the injuries, I ended up failing the physical. Uh, then I played in the Arena League, and I retired myself from mm-hmm. the Arena uh, from the Arena League. Mm-hmm. But while I was training and trying to rehab, uh, I was able to. Um, well, one of the older frat brothers had an opportunity. Mm-hmm. It was during the uh, the DTAE Department of Technical and Adult Education. They were doing a statewide rollout, getting ready for Y two. I mean the uh, the Y two K. Yes. Oh my goodness. Which was. <laughs> It was. I think people thought the pandemic was the Y two K because right. everybody had the scare it was going to be in the dark, the Stone Ages, and everything's going to shut down. So I helped roll out that initiative while I worked out. Okay. So I, I was able to once again negotiate because I proved I had the leverage, the background. I had a degree. I was responsible. Mm-hmm. I laid out what my plans were. However, I I knew I needed to get some experience. I never had a job outside of training and playing a sport. My parents said, you all had the rest of your life to work. Right. So they allowed us to play our sports, go to school, get the degrees. So that was my first chance to, to get some OJT, some on the job training. Right. So I worked half a day and then I would train the other half or vice versa. And then uh, I started doing uh, web design. Okay. I started programming and writing uh, web applications and giving people uh, web presence. Uh, and so it was, it was one th- I was playing football down in Miami in the Arena League, which was a, it was a good league. They paid well. Right. I think I made fifteen hundred dollars a week. They paid for our housing, mm-hmm. and they paid us incentives on the field. That's a great hustle when you're twenty two, right? And I'm in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you do the math, man. Right. That's that's a pretty good amount of money. Uh, what was that six thousand dollars a month? Easily. You know, for six months. And they paying for my housing, right. so I was able to stack. And then I was able to work my side because I had my laptop and I was able to do web design. Right. So I was multitasking mm-hmm. um, because I, I just knew I wanted my own. It wasn't a slight at pops, you know, mm-hmm. working 34 years. I just knew because the, the biggest thing for me was I was like, Dad, do you think you could make a call to somebody over at AT&T? I'm from Georgia, got a Georgia degree, Terry College of Business, MIS. Right. You've been there 33 years. You can't make a call. Right? It wasn't a slight against them. Right. It was just pops. We need to put ourselves and our kids, my kids, their kids in a better scenario to where they have options. Mm-hmm. So that's what set me on the path so we can have options. Right? Because for me to have a name, you've been there. Right. I had a degree. Right. You should be able to pick up the phone like my counterparts from Dunwoody were able to do with their dads right? and they get a job. They have a ball in college because the only thing they have to do is get a degree in <laughs> pizza crust <laughs> and they'll have a hundred thousand dollar a year job. Easily. <laughs> Easily. Easily. And it, you know, some have to work harder than others. Right. I'm not putting everybody in that box, but most of them have the, um, the connection, the connection, the resources, the resources. That's their resources. Right. That's the word. And so that's what I'm trying to create the legacy for our, gen- you know, generations behind me. So mm-hmm. we have, options and resources okay um so then i started uh doing web design and i I ended up retiring totally and then i felt that i couldn't spread enough and meet enough people to generate enough revenue so i started selling it and i started recruiting graphic designers and web developers to work for me i would get their price then i would mark it up right i would do a percentage well, I would get a percentage, then I would market it. Right. I'll just, just, so it's 25 years. They can't get mad at me now. Right, right. You know, I paid them. You, right. I, I, I ask you what you want. Then, then we negotiate Then something. we negotiate It was something. fair and equitable. You said you were fine. Okay. <laughs> hey, I'm just like that. I asked you what you wanted to be paid. Exactly. I paid you. Yeah. Now that you found out there was there something. There was something. Yeah. That that's, ain't, that's, don't, that, yeah. Don't, <laughs> didn't you get money? Right. A bunch of money. Right. You know, so that's how I really... Uh, transition over uh, into what I'm doing now. And then when uh, the crash hit in 2008, um, my contract with uh, APS, a company that had a contract with them, I was a contractor. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was a system engineer. So I was uh, maintaining all of the network infrastructure, the wireless, uh, the land, local area networks, uh, the technology. I was over that and I had an area and I had five people under me. Okay. And 
that happened right after because I had the experience while I was playing. I was I was moonlighting. Gotcha. In in the space, so I was multitasking. You multitasking in in the space. Mm-hmm. Um, then when it crashed, yet I lost the contract. I had to go out on my own. So my target was uh, medical practices, uh, doctors. I mean dentists mm-hmm. maintaining their small area, local area networks. Okay, getting them online uh, if they wanted to, maintaining it. And then I got into talent acquisition, and uh, you know human capital, hmm. and that's what Quest Development is now. That's what I do now. I consult with Fortune 500 companies and uh, get an idea of what their technology initiatives are, give them some insight, and uh, I'll find somebody to do the work for them. And based on that, um, I do percentages again um, of their annual salary. Mm. So it's usually 20% of annual salary. So that sweet spot can fall from 75 to $150,000 a year. Right. And 20% is usually my, my rate. Your rate. That I charge. So on a hundred thousand, that's twenty thousand dollar for a placement. Not bad. And then uh, quest, uh, then Game Breaker. I started Game Breaker, uh, which is a sports company, sports specialist, specialty company. It started off as an apparel company because we wanted to create something with meaning. So those that are in the the, the space uh, understand what a Game Breaker is. It's being at the top of your game. Right. It's when you're mentally and spiritually strong, a way of life. Um, you know, game breakers are patient enough to receive delayed gratification from hard work contributed in reaching a goal. And I came up with that watching Dion Monday Night Football, Cowboys against Philadelphia. And my business partner and I, we weren't, we weren't business partners at the time. We were just, you know, workout buddies. Mm-hmm. And uh, we training. We in between teams. And uh, we watching the Monday Night game. And the game was on the line. And we said, man, <laughs> I know they ain't going to kick the ball to Dion. And uh, they ended up punting the ball to Dion, and he ran the ball back for a touchdown. They right. win the game. Right. And we said he a game breaker just in that moment. So we started carving out right. what a game breaker is because we've always wanted to be associated with game breaker. Right. Game breaker, it transcends sports. You know, Maven Sports, game breakers. Right. Travis Stroud, game breaker. Right. Terry Johnson is a game breaker. Right. Right. Those front liners are game breakers at the end of the day. Everybody want to be associated with it. So we, we got the trademark uh, registered uh, and we started creating a brand within that. And then the brand, which I have on right now. Yes. Um, started to kind of uh, change into opportunities in film and television. Uh, Rob Hardy. He's a big time director, producer. He had an opportunity uh, when he was working at, for BET on the game. And he had an opportunity to do a full, a live uh, football sequence. And he asked me 48 hours if I could come up with 40 or 50 players, uh, 40 or 50 players, and then choreograph a scene based on the script. Right. So that's what I, uh, I ended up doing it. Uh, because of favor and rapport and relationships, I was able to empower some of the, the locals, the semi-pro guys here. They were doing it for free anyway. Let's get on tape. Let's make you immortal. And you get money and, and, and get a different experience. Mm-hmm. And um, so we were able to uh, do a great job in that regard. And um, excuse me. And we wanted to uh, do something to help brand uh, the product as well. So I started training athletes, game work apparel. So I would tie the cost of the, the garment into the training. So that's units right. sold. Right. So I had to get my numbers up one way or another because of my expertise or me being a subject matter expert. Um, in sports, I was able to leverage the apparel as well. Uh, then we kind of matriculated over into wardrobe. Mm-hmm. So we got product placement and a couple shows that we've, uh, we've done as well in order to brand what Game Breaker is. Uh, now we're starting to refocus, um, you know, Game Breaker. So those are the two initiatives um, that I do a lot of my day-to-day with. Those are the two main companies that I, that I engage with. But what I like the most is in you sharing that journey, sports was the foundation. You say, hey, here's my platform, yeah. which is going to create these opportunities. And you and from there you leverage that to create these business entities. It's still in a space that you know. Like you said, you're the subject matter expert. Yeah. 
I want to go a little further with Game Breaker because it is a fascinating story. You're, you're right. It started as a, an innovative apparel company in that space. And then you have a piece about athlete development, the mental capacity piece yep. that you're still doing. You yep. know, So you know, we know the competitors of the Nikes and Under Armors and everything else, and you sit in that space. But that your uniqueness is helping an athlete from an amateur status to a professional understand the mental Whoever's listening, I would love some insight and, and help in this space because a lot of um, uh, companies, Nike and Under Armour, they don't have a give back piece. Any school that I've sold apparel to, I've gone back to speak and embed myself in my business party. He, Notre Dame University, uh, went right. to University of Notre Dame, mm -hmm. played at a high level. Right. Shout out to Corey Fitzpatrick. Um, so we usually share ourselves with the community. We give back. If we make a percentage, we are share a percentage. Uh, I work now with the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, uh, play a smart program in Atlanta Public Schools. Uh, something I was doing for free, they just so happened, you know, pay me right now. But that's a part of my, my vision anyway. I was already doing it uh, and building rapport and helping kids that truly want to have the opportunity to transition from one phase of their lives to the next and be brutally honest up front because you, every kid has a dream to be a D1 athlete. But every kid has the option to play on the next level if they're realistic. You got D3 schools that's academic, so you have to be a good student because you have to get academic you know, monies mm -hmm. to do that. You have D2s that you can get athletic scholarships. You have D1 AA's. You have HBCUs. And then you have the D1s. So you have an opportunity. Those are different levels depending on uh, your performance ratio and how you, know, how you perform in the classroom. Uh, I help them understand and navigate um, through the process of advocacy, being a mentor, them and their parents, because my parents never went through the process of being highly recruited. So insight that my dad could have given me, I can give my son because I learned it through the process. Now I'm able to share that information with, with students that, uh, that want to go to college, right, that may not play on the next level. So I can prepare them, give them the, uh, the, the, the tools they need as, you know, from SAT, ACT prep, uh, to how to study, how to annotate notes, how to be present. Uh, I don't do study halls. I get tutorial schedules from teachers, and I make the kid, uh, I hold a kid accountable to be present. That way, you're just not looked at as being as athlete. You're engaging, mm -hmm. right? You're just not going to study hall when you're around all your peers. Right. I need you to be uncomfortable. I want you to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. If you don't know what that math problem is and you're in your classroom with the girl you like and you might think she, she may thank you, you know, whatever, I need you to say forget that. I need this knowledge in order for me to get to where I'm trying to go. Right. And you need to be comfortable doing that, asking those questions. So my, 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 um, my involvement is a little bit more uh, intricate. I help professionals, guys that are, you know, coming out the league, transitioning out the league, may have all the money in the world, but don't have a, a, a understanding of, of what's next. If people allow me to help them, I will help them because people will judge you based on what you have, and they don't even understand the duck syndrome. <laughs> that duck on top of the water looked like the coolest animal un in the world. Right. But you look under the surface, he kicking his little heart out. Right. And that's the thing. We got to start, you know, looking and, 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 and I guess taking situations for what they are. You know, you never understand or walk in another man's shoes until you've had a chance to engage them and, and understand their story. What's Game Breaker's website? So for our listeners who want to get more information and in contact with them, what's your website? Yeah, it's, it's GameBreaker.net, www.GameBreaker.net. I apologize. My mouth got tongue tied. <laughs> <laughs> it just that, that happens. It. That happens. Yeah, and uh, Game Breaker Nation IG, uh, real Travis Stroud IG. If y'all want to uh, check that out, but uh, it's it's been a grind, man. We, we're still growing. Like I said, I I uh, did choreography, film and TV last year. Uh, I was the uh, marketing consultant on the Brian Banks uh, movie. Uh, good friend of mine, wrongfully accused of a crime he didn't commit because of his platform and being a pretty good athlete. Right. He told someone no and someone didn't like what he said. And he lost 11 years of his life, six years in prison, four years on the registered uh, offenders list uh, until he was later vindicated. Um, I got a chance to uh, uh, build a relationship with him and travel around the country with him 
uh, doing player development work, you know, with uh, NFL teams and college teams. Um, and it, it changed my perspective because my career ended through injury. He is through circumstance. He had no control. Wow. So 0.08% of kids transition to play on the next level. Mm-hmm. 92 point, you know, zero two percent don't right and that point zero eight percent is because of the injury is because of circumstance it is a numbers game so you got to be okay with what happens as long as you give your all give your all yeah so with all this being a father tell me what are you taking from your father what are you taking from your experience and how you point it to your son what what have you those things that worked those things that didn't work and things that you've learned around want to take us through that journey because you are preparing your son for the next turn and i share with our listeners earlier he is an athlete young man big for his yeah. size um academically on the top of the class yeah. you know so same type of we path. had to put hands on him <laughs> for the academic, but he, he is doing his thing no no what i learned is uh like i said routine consistency hard work um Definitely ownership, accountability is what I pour into uh, to my son and my daughter. I think I'm harder on my daughter than I am my son. My 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 daughter, she's in the arts. She says she that's her athletic, her dance, her dance. You know, she wants to dance. Right. So uh, I focus on him because he's the closest person to leaving the nest. She got a little bit more time with daddy. Got I it. hope God willing, if right. he bless me, right. uh, to be here. So um, my dad was hard on me because he coached me he was lenient on you know my my other two brothers when I, when I say lenient he didn't drive them as hard as he drove me and what happens is being that I have kids now I realize that some kids need a little bit more than others right and maybe he needed to put them in. <laughs> he needed to lay into me a little bit more, more. Than, right and he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself okay um but I think some of the drive drove me to making bad decisions. And when I say that, the reason I started Game Breaker is because I wanted to stay affiliated with sports. It was so hurtful that I had to leave the game outside of my terms that I didn't want to engage on the field. I felt that those who coached couldn't mm. play. Okay. And that was one of the craziest things that I ever had because I'm pretty good at giving instruction and training athletes and getting buy-in from them. Um, and I think the drive of my dad not really encouraging our actions drove me to prove him wrong, mm. right? When I may have should have, I should have probably gone a different track, right? I've still been successful, right? Still done some great things, but I think I went blindly at something to prove pops, man. I told you I could do it. I told you we could do it. Right. It wasn't like me going against him. I just told you we could we could do it. You gave me the name. You said make it better than it was when I gave it to you. I told you we could do it. Versus me really looking at the landscape and identifying that uh, Kirby signed a $49.7 million deal at the University of Georgia. It ain't but a select few guys make that kind of money in the league or on the next level. Mm -hmm. And he can make that until he's 80. 75, right. 70 years. Nick Saban's almost 70. And just think, he's been the highest paid coach in college football for some time. That's wealth. And you're sowing seeds in the kids. you still involved in what you love. So um, that's I'm, I'm really instilling in, in my kids is understanding what your ability is, um, what's your motivation, why you do what you do, right? And then your attitude affects how well you do what you do. Mm. So that's what those are the three points of my book and what I'm writing. Um, examples of, you know, identify good, and then once you identify something that you enjoy and you love, turn it into a business. Figure out how to get paid for it. Versus going out to be a doctor, lawyer, coming out of college with two hundred thousand dollar debt, and then you can make a pretty good living, but you're still burdened with having to pay somebody back. Let's figure out how we can uh, create these transitions to make these uh, iPhones work. Let's come up with some intellectual property that we can create and get some residual off of. Find a problem and get in the way and create a solution. So I got them thinking along the lines of that. Everybody isn't meant to be a boss, um, but you can be the boss of self mm -hmm. and have some direction 
you can set some goals and then you can plan it out if things don't work the way they're supposed to as long as we pray about it we never everything is in the will of god and how we move is based accordingly right if that didn't happen it wasn't supposed to you got to move forward right and i just started to get to that point right it it took me i'll be i ain't gonna tell you how old i am <laughs> i'll be mid 40s here soon <laughs> i'm early 40s mid 40s y'all choose between that so it took me uh 20 years out the game to to get to that point because all the guys around me that's my boys they lived the life that i thought i wanted mm. they was able to play in the league they went to the hall you know and those are goals that's still on my shelf that i have to go ahead and take down that's the humbling experience is when you look at your wall of accomplishments mm -hmm. and you got to remove some of the stuff that you will know never it'll never happen that's one of the most humbling experiences, but then you have to refocus and do what you can control. It may not have been meant for me, but it may be meant for my son and my daughter. The relationships that we're building now or the seeds that we're sowing now may not be for me to eat or harvest. It may be meant for them and their kids, you know, to harvest it. So that's just where I am now, man. That's why I treat people the way I want to be treated. Those are, my dad always taught us that, mm. you know, uh, treat people the way you want to be treated. Uh, be accountable. Look a man in his eye. What I find very interesting is when I asked that question, if you guys notice, he talked about the plan. It wasn't about the plan of let's be a better athlete. We know the training is there. Oh. You know, he talked about accomplishing goals, creating a legacy, you know, you know, having wealth for generations. You know, because this game of sports, there is a, a start and a finish. At some point, yeah, point. we're going to start and finish. We don't know when or where. Yeah. But how do we leverage it during that time to get to the ultimate goal that we have for ourselves, but more, more importantly, the purpose that God has for us? I think that's where I go from there. I'm going to ask you to give us any last words of encouragement to our listeners. You know, we talk about the rise, the fall, and the rise again. I think my listeners may be saying, but what was the fall? I want people to understand there was not really a fall. It was a fall. But it was, it was the fall of me having to take down those those goals and accomplishments that I uh, I set for myself. And then when you have early levels of success, it can be a gift and a curse. Because if you fall short of that bar you set for yourself, you look at yourself as a failure. And you can fall into a state of true depression, hopelessness, right? And then when you're hopeless and you're disappointed, uh, it turns to discouragement then you see people start going through the motions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like voting. You know, the reason why a lot of African-Americans feel or they don't vote is because they don't feel they can make a difference when we have to do the, the action anyway. The only thing we can do is what we control. You control how you vote. Right. You control how you treat people. You can't re control how people respond to you, right? So you can control the energy that you put out to the universe the vibe that you put out to the interview uh, the, the the universe uh is, is really important and know that it's the small things you got to do the small things really good in order for opportunity or the possibility of big things to happen mm. so the little things like getting up making up your bed having a routine yes sir no sir yes ma'am no ma'am um being courteous right having a a a, a spirit of giving versus receiving um, and I think once we start doing things that we can control and those, those small things start to happen, the gateways are open for, you know, whatever it is that you have desired, uh, uh whatever it is you want to, you want to accomplish. Wow. Wow. Great, great words. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been my pleasure to have this conversation with, I guess, Mr. Travis Stride. I mean, what he imparted was so rich on so many levels. And I want you to understand that when we talk about sports, athletes, the fan, the competition, the business, it goes be more than what you see on the field. It's that journey of what we go through. And with this conversation, I hope you understand that there are some things that are always consistent. Have a plan. Work that plan. Know that there are going to be some 
roadblocks or some things that may fall short but if you're prepared you can overcome and still move forward in success be one of faith believe in yourself be respectful of others and if you do that you will always rise to the top i'm terry johnson within the game presented by maven sports we thank you until next time we'll see you in the game